Oh, and it's time. Uh, yeah, thank you all for coming, even though apparently there's a very popular talk going on at the same time. So, yeah, thank you for choosing this one over the other one. Um, this is not going to be a technical talk. If you want more technical insights into XMPP, I'll refer you to talks I gave in the past. Um, you can find most of them on MediaCCCDE, for example, by uh, searching for XMPP or searching for my name. Um, some of them are also linked from the FrostCon uh, schedule. I think that's okay, right? Um, yeah, instead I want to talk more generally about the um, XMPP community, um, the events we organize and essentially how we develop software. And after that I want to dive very briefly into some commercial uses um, of XMPP um, because that are things that you might not know as a regular user. Um, yeah, then we will simply go over a bunch of clients that are currently in active development showcase some of them. And last but not least, I want to share some observations I made um, while working on XMPP. So it's not directly a summary from my talk, but more general things that I noticed. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to refer to the group of people that I want to talk about. In previous talks, I used the term Jabber to refer to the network of publicly federating servers as opposed to XMPP is a protocol that uh, can be used in all sorts of contexts. Um, but I don't like that word uh, very much anymore, uh, partially because Cisco owns uh, the trademark on that word. And yeah, so I wasn't really sure what to call that. I mean, non-commercial would be another um, term, but that also isn't a really good fit either because there are some commercially operated providers that are still part of that network, and there are also like clients that you have to pay for. Um, so just note when I say open source community, I'm basically referring to people like you and I that are using the publicly federating servers. Um, so let's begin by asking ourselves um, who uses XMPP? Obviously, in a federated um, system, we have no way of knowing who uses XMPP, and that's a good thing. Um, most providers make a point in not uh, storing things like the IP address and generally store as little data as necessary. Um, and even if some public servers would publish that information, we don't account for the countless of personal and small office servers that fly entirely under the radar. Um, however, if we knew that XMPP, for example, was over or underrepresented in a certain country, for example, um, we could learn from that and repeat what we do in successful countries and the less successful ones and attempt to grow the community that way. Um, so what these download stats from conversations um, show is that they pretty much confirm what I observe myself when talking to users or in our chat room or when looking at the users on the GitHub issue tracker. Um, also, I, I made the observation that when I tell someone at a conference here in Germany, like FrostCon or the Chaos Communication Congress, that I'm working on XMPP, that they, are, that they do know what I'm talking about. They might not use it, they might not even like it, but they still have heard of XMPP. Um, however, last year I was a, at a conference in Singapore, uh, and during the occasion hallway discussions, I mentioned that I'm working on XMPP, and nobody had a clue what I was talking about. Um, similarly, when I'm at the Google, Mentor, Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit in, uh, in the United States, which had a pretty international audience, I also uh, feel like I have to explain what XMPP is. Um, so, yeah, th those stats pretty much like, confirm that observation. Um, however, you have to know that um, the data is kind of problematic anyway. Um, because roughly only 25% of users get um, conversations from the Play Store, and the rest uses F-Droid. And even that 25% is problematic, because it's just a guess. Um, 
Now if you look at the download sets from Conversations Legacy, which is available for free on the Google Play Store, we see something interesting. Um, so out of nowhere, we suddenly see Indonesia, Indonesia on that list. Um, while the rest of the list remains roughly the same. We have Russia on this list, we have Spain and the United States, we all saw them on the other list as well. Um, I actually don't have a good explanation for that. Um, obviously, two euros is a lot more money in Indonesia, and more importantly, people in Indonesia, Indonesia might not have credit cards. Um, but it's not like the free version would see like an equal distribution worldwide. It's still that it's skewed towards Germany, and then we just got Indonesia additionally on that list. And also, Xaba, which is also available for free, which is an alternative client, um, reported similar stats on Twitter that they also see like Germany, Russia, and in Indonesia as their top three countries. Um, when we look at the Quixi stats, it's even more obvious. Um, and that's, that kind of makes sense because um, I only ever mentioned Quixi during the initial presentation I gave in Berlin, and then it was mentioned by a German online magazine, and then by an offline computer magazine also in Germany, so it it's kind of makes sense um, that we see that Germany is like, has a lot of the users. Um, however, it, it also gives us a guideline on, on what we have to do to spread it over the rest of the globe, and that's basically like telling users about it. Um, so, this data is um, highly problematic as well, um, since the people who gathered that data um, used only one probably fairly biased list of servers, and also they looked at the A record, not as the SFV record, so they basically looked at where the website is hosted, not where the XMPP server is hosted. Um, but still, how, if there's at least some truth to that data, it also confirms what we are seeing in the other statistics. Um, and also, like, if a vast majority of XMPP users are from Germany, it's natural to assume that they use and operate servers in Germany. Um, interestingly, uh, the people who published that data uh, tried to spin it into an argument on how XMPP isn't really federated because all the servers are in the same place. However, to me, it's just obvious that users pick servers close to them. Um, Looking at the developers of XMPP, um, it becomes harder and easier at the same time. Um, there's no central instance that would collect uh, that data. Um, the XMPP Standards Foundation has a list of members, but that doesn't keep track of where they are from. And that's also ignoring um, that um, some developers are not registered with the uh, XMPP Standards Foundation anyway. Um, so what I did instead was go over the list of XMPP uh, software on the XMPP org list and like manually looked into GitHub profile uh, pages or contact information on websites and stuff like that to like collect that list. And, and again, you see a lot of Europe, um, Germany and France in particular stood out and again like Russia and the United States. Um, yeah, so lately, although many uh, events are uh, organized in the XMPP community, and first and foremost, that's the um, XSF Summit. Um, that's the main event, basically, where the open source and the non-open source people come together and discuss upcoming extensions and long-term plans for the future of XMPP. Um, this year, discussions included um, better message archiving, like storing messages and the metadata, like uh, uh, read information or, on, or delivery information together. And we also talked about um, Mix, which is um, in some future going to replace a Mark as the group chat protocol. And that's always a very intense um, two days because uh, they're like, 50 experts in that field sitting around one conference table and having very like in-depth conversations about um, like the innards of XMPP. Um, 
Yeah, and there are also more like community organized events. Um, we try to avoid the term hackathon because that was hijacked by the industry to mean something else. Um, but it's usually developers coming together, uh, usually over a weekend, and to learn from each other, to rapid prototype things that might require like both server and the client implementation, and just to be social and meet basically the people they've previously only known online. Um, actually found early attempts of that that date back uh, to 2013. Um, but for a year now, we've been doing them on a fairly regular basis. Um, usually, everyone could organize one themselves, and um, we try to help you or guide you to organize a sprint yourself. We have like a um, how-to uh, on our wiki, and um, we also will give you visibility. Um, there's a marketing team within the XSF, and we will, when you want to organize a sprint, um, we will help you like get the word out. Um, but the vast majority of the sprints this year or last year have been organized by uh, one person. Thank you, Pep. You're not here, but thank you. Um, yeah, but lately, after like publishing the how-to and stuff, like basically everyone would have the power to do that themselves. And if there are any questions, we'll still help you or even like attend your sprint. Um, also, that's like more informal. Um, there are meetups. Uh, there are monthly meetings, and it's just people coming together, also users, not just developers, but also XMPP users. Um, Berlin, Bo the Berlin meetup is the longest going. It's already going for several years now, and there are times where just two people would show up, but they kept it going and just continued doing it. And nowadays, there are like 10 to 20 people um, showing up. Uh, in Dresden, where I'm currently living, we started one like three months ago. And there we have like five to ten people coming. Yeah, the Berlin and the Dresden ones are actually next week, and the Munich one is the week after that. So if you're living in one of those cities, feel free to come there. Yeah, and also um, we are attending conferences. Um, for example, the XSF themselves, they have a booth at FOSDEM because um, FOSDEM is right after the XMPP uh, summit, and that's kind of the most official one that you can get like the official merch. You could buy like an XMPP hoodie and get bottle openers and stickers. And yeah, in recent history, we all also attended the CCC events. Um, and we are going to attend camp um, in two weeks, I guess. Um, however, those resemble more sprints than booths at normal conferences. Um, However, you could still come by and talk to us or get stickers and stuff like that. And yeah, of course, we, are, we also have a booth here at, uh, at FrostCon, uh, which was actually very well visited today. But feel free to come by tomorrow if you haven't already today. Um, yeah, let's look into um, some improvements that happen to the ecosystem itself. That's not like improvements to servers or clients, but to the general yeah, ecosystem that kind of like um, improves the user experience for users wanting to use XMPP. Um, uh, so that's one of the coolest projects that have emerged in the last year. Uh, it will basically find you open conferences or open group chats to talk to other people. And it, what it does, it, it crawls a vast number of servers and then generates a list of public rooms ordered by the number of participants so that you are finding the, um, the good ones first. And it also allows you to search. Uh, yeah, usually that's a website. Um, but it also has an API so that you can integrate that into your client. And um, so users of your client would automatically find someone to talk to if they are new to XMPP, for example. Um, obviously, it's a centralized um, service that would either collect your IP address or could potentially collect your IP address or your Java ID, depending on whether you are accessing the API over HTTP or XMPP. But yeah, I guess that's just what you have to live with. So there's no other way to solve that problem. Um, and a nice little project um, is the mark badge that if you want to link your XMPP group chats from your website or from your project's GitHub page, um, you can 
use that instead, and it integrates nicely into the list of badges you might have anyway, and displays how many people are currently in that list, and you can also like link it automatically to that list. So if people have an XMPP client installed, they can click that badge and will get right into that group chat. Um, also, while we are on the topic of um, badges, if you operate a public XMPP service, there's another badge that you can stick on your website and that uses uh, information generated by status.conversations.im, and that's basically like a monitoring tool uh, that, uh, that will check if your um, XMPP server is online and available, but it needs credentials to log in, so um, you would have to go to status.conversations.im and enter credentials, like test credentials, obviously, for your server, and then like 30 days later, you could stick that badge on your website if you want to. Um, yeah, so one of the arguments you hear often against XMPP is that there are too many extensions, and as an implementer, you don't know what to implement, and as a user, you don't know what client to download, and there's certainly some truth to that. Um, we currently have more than 400 extensions. Um, so to counteract that, for a while we had so-called compliance suites, which are, basic, which are basically meant for developers to tell them, um, implement those 10 extensions and everything will be fine. And there are different profiles. Um, for example, the web client might need to implement a slightly different set of extensions uh, than, let's say, a mobile client. And recently, we made some efforts to also expose that information to end users. Uh, a client that is compliant to a certain profile can show a badge to the users, and then users can specifically look for compliant clients, sort of a seal of approval. Um, Ideally, it would also act as an incentive for developers to implement uh, the compliancy profiles. Uh, currently, there's a design competition going on on how that seal of approval um, might look like. And so, as a client developer, you either know if you implemented one of the compliance suites and just show the badge, uh, or you, there could also possibly be uh, self-assessment tests in the future where you basically check off every extension that you've implemented and then and, and it will tell you what profile um, you implemented. And uh, there's a uh, prototype for that uh, on Bitbucket. Um, or even better, you could um, put all the extensions you implemented in a special XML file together with um, some additional information about your project, and then the xmpp.org website uh, that lists different clients could automatically determine that based on the XML file. Um, but if you make the information machine readable, you can also do the reverse. So when viewing XZAP, you could also um, see what software implements that specific extension. Um, so, actually, the vast majority of servers these days is compliant. Um, so, it's, it's usually just a case on whether or not your uh, service up to date and configured correctly. And so, there's a compliance tester. Um, um, so, it's not meant to check out server software, but more check out if you as a provider have configured everything correctly. And it also has like email notifications and direct access to help if you're missing something. So if you're checking your own server and it detects that something is missing to be fully compliant, it will automatically tell you, oh, you need to change this and that in your configuration file to, yeah, to fix the issue or update your server or whatever. Um, so recently, there have also been uh, some attempts to unify the UX across different clients. Um, that doesn't mean having the same UI in every client, but at least some um, common vocabulary, for example. Um, for example, what to call a group chat, or even what to call the Jab ID, or should we call it XMPP address. Um, so yeah, there was one sprint um, recently, where we specifically only like try to develop that common vocabulary and um, try to discuss how we can make the clients more uniform. And also, there's a neat little extension um, called consistent color generation, 
what it does is basically that if one user is dis has a red avatar, like a red automatically generated avatar on one client, it will also have the same shade of red on the other client. So that's that it will be easier to like recognize the user across different clients. So if my friend Peter is green on one client, he will also be green on the other client. Um, yeah. So on the topic of growing the community, that's twofold. On one hand, we obviously want to attract more users, um, but we also desperately need more developers. Um, a vast majority of developers only work part-time on XMPP, and that in, ter in turn means to compensate for that, um, we need to attract more developers. Um, growing the user base is simple but not easy. Um, essentially what we do is we need to spread the word. For example, that graph um, is the Quixie downloads on the Play Store after it received publicity on a um, German computer magazine. And this also ties back to the beginning of the talk. Um, and uh, basically, the reason I believe that conversations are significantly more successful in Germany is um, that we get some news coverage here in Germany while we get no news coverage um, in other countries. Um, yeah, and like I said, we also recognize that we need more developers. Um, proper companies have dedicated uh, people for that, so-called developer ad advocates um, that go to every conference uh, in the world and tell everyone how great their tooling is. And yeah, and they also write documentation to make it easier for people. And we all have to do that ourselves. Um, however, we identified the need for it and we're trying to set aside some time to, to do all that. Yeah. Um, talking about commercial usage of XMPP is always a bit challenging because uh, people are often oddly secretive about things. And when I'm working on commercial projects, I'm usually under NDA uh, most of the time. So for me, it's actually easier to talk about other people's projects. Um, yeah, however, I still want to give you some examples. Um, one funny example I learned about recently um, that a fashion label was using is it because apparently um, when you buy expensive fashion these days, you are not going into a store or like an, even an online store, but you buy it on Instagram or Snapchat. And then they were using XMPP to funnel all that communication from the different channels into their back end. Um, yeah, also NATO and a lot of government agencies are using XMPP. Um, usually they use special clients from companies that specifically uh, cater to that market. And then those clients have special features like uh, marking a message as top secret or only for Germany. And then they have basically XMPP firewalls sitting in between, for example, the UK, UK army and the German armies that then filters out messages based on that criteria. But uh, I also know at least of one intelligence agency that uses vanilla conversations with vanilla EJBD. Um, so, yeah, but you might ask yourself why, um, what do we have? I mean, what's in for us if, if NATO uses XMPP, right? They're using their own clients, so what's in for us? And it's, it's a lot of implementation experience, so like on the... XSF Summit, roughly half of them are working like in those closed source projects. And um, when they implement Mix, for example, which again is the successor to, to Mark for group chat, um, they might not able to share the implementation, but they are definitely able to share the experience and then we can learn from that. And also a lot of the um, big servers are um, backed by companies who make money with those type of customers. And that's why a lot of the servers actually um, relatively up-to-date with all the extensions. Um, so yeah, let's talk about clients. Um, so there's converse.js, and that's not just the best web client um, you can get, but also one of the best clients overall. It's fairly actively developed. Um, it has had two major releases over the last um, 12 months and countless of mine and bug fix releases. Um, last year, the developer actually worked full-time on that. 
Uh, and now he has a job where he's allowed to work on Converse. And yeah, last year it received uh, Omimo support, support for HTTP upload. And um, the latest version, which was actually released this week, um, got support for stream management, which means you can um, switch over from Bosch to WebSockets, which should be way more efficient. Um, Moving also interesting because um, it's one of the few web clients and it's actually more of a social network with chat capabilities. Um, and yeah, I'm mentioning it here um, because A, it's, it's like doing a little bit, things a little bit different, it's more of a social network and that shows you that you can also use XMPP to develop that. But it was also the first client that uh, implemented emoji reactions, which are basically like thumbs up to a message, for example, and that's like also the new hotness in the XMPP community and the stuff that other clients are currently working on um, as well. Um, it does require a PHP backend for proxying and caching things, so it doesn't talk to your XMPP um, uh, server directly, so if you want to set it up, it's, it's a little bit more complicated to do than, for example, just running um, Converse, which is just JavaScript that you can to live on a website. Um, yeah, so Dino uses GTK and on paper is platform independent. Um, got Domimo and HTTP upload about a year ago. Um, also has um, support for PGP, which is interesting because it's one of the newer clients that like deliberately implemented PGP, even though that's a fairly old extension. Um, progress is slow but steady. Um, a uh, Google Summer of Code student is currently working on um, Jingle file transfer, which you would need if you want to tr transmit really large files that are not covered by HTTP upload, because usually on HTTP upload there's a file size limit. And yeah, then Dino, if, it tr if you're trying to transmit a file that is larger than what HTTP upload allows, it will automatically fall back to basically peer-to-peer -to -peer file transfer, which is the same that Conversations is doing as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's my personal daily driver. Um, however, there's no official release yet, um, which is like super annoying because um, like people on macOS and Windows have, <laughs> have to compile it themselves. Um, yeah, but it still has a very clean UI and also basic, uh, all the basic features, so people still flock to it even though it's, it doesn't have like an official release. Um, so there's Gatum, that's basically um, the polar opposite to Dino, it has all the XMPP features, like all of them. And in parts the UI is a little bit cluttered and the code base is a mess. And it's, it's a pretty old client, the current maintainer, I think it's the third maintainer of that client. Um, however, the maintainer is um, act actively working on cleaning it up and cleaning up both the code base and the UI. And he's also very involved in the community and interested in, in supporting new things. Um, for example, the current master branch has support for the Mux search that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, and he's also, yeah, like I said, trying to clean up the UI and become a little bit more like Dino in that way. Um, but I'm afraid it might be difficult to uh, shake off the preconception of cluttered UI, even if it will improve in the future. So, yeah, let's see how that will go. Um, so Poetio, that's basically the, the gadget of text UIs. Um, it has plugins for almost everything, um, except unfortunately Omimo, but it is in the works, I hear. But it has plugins for HTTP upload, um, emoji reactions, and yeah, everything. Um, yeah, there's one for, for code like uh, highlighting and rendering um, avatars, even though it's technically a console client. And yeah, it's, it's kind of the prosody of clients. It's, it's pr pretty easy to prototype it because it's written in Python and everyone knows at least a little bit of Python. Um, yeah, then there's uh, Profanity, which is also like a console client. Um, noteworthy because it um, got Omimo support just very recently and it also has support for HTTP upload. Um, so yeah, there's um, UWPX, um, interesting because uh, usually Windows support for XMPP clients is always a second class citizens uh, because um, 
most XPP developers are on Linux or whatever. And so that's interesting because like that's a dedicated Windows client client and it uses the um, universal Windows platform toolkit um, which allows you to write the same software for different platforms so it will run on your Windows and on your Xbox for example and like technically it would also run on Windows phones which would be super cool if Windows uh, Microsoft wouldn't have uh, stopped making those so um, yeah uh, it's also interesting um, because it has some basic support for Omimo, but virtually nothing else. So they prioritized Omimo over HTTP upload and stream management and MAM and, and everything. And it's, it's still very alpha, but yeah, interesting because of all the other reasons. Um, so there's Kaiden, that's, which also has an interesting concept because it um, uses Qt and the uh, KDE Kirigami um, library to be truly platform independent. Um, so on paper, it would work on, on your Android phone, on, on your Mac OS, on, on KDE. Um, however, it doesn't really feel native on Android. Um, for example, the file slash image picker um, uses a built-in file browser that can only um, access files um, within the Kaiden space, so you can um, could share the, the database of Kaiden, but nothing else because you don't have permissions to access anything else. Uh, it also doesn't stay connected in the background on Android. Um, I'm not sure if they're, they're able to fix it or, or yeah. Um, but it supports things like HTTP upload, as you can see in the screenshot, obviously. Um, but it doesn't have support for group chats just yet and no support um, for Mimo. However, both of them. Um, are planned for the next two milestones. Um, Chat Secure, yeah, um, not much happened in the last year of Chat Secure. Um, a couple of maintenance releases where they bumped the versions of libraries. Um, he's currently working on porting it to macOS. Um, so There's a project catalyst thing which allows you to port uh, an iOS app to uh, macOS, and he's currently working on that. Um, However, it's still probably one of the best options if you're using iOS, and it supports HTTP upload and, and Omimo. Um, so there's Monil, another iOS client uh, that has actually been around for a while, uh, but um, wasn't very active for quite some time. Um, however, the development pace has increased lately, and it also has support for Omimo. And it doesn't have support for group chats, though. Um, yeah. But since the yeah, all clients on uh, iOS are less than ideal, so yeah, I'm mentioning all of that, so you can like I don't know pick and choose. Um, yeah, so obviously there's conversations, and for the most uh, part of 2019, it was focused on stability rather than chasing new features, and. I only did a few things, like incorporating the changes from the UX sprint, um, where I like, made it use the, the common vocabulary that we, that we came up with. And it also gained support for the max search. And um, backups is also a feature that it got this year. Um, yeah, however, I do have a roadmap map towards um, Conversations 3.0, and notes that it's definitely not a timeline, um, just the plans that I have for the future. However, I have secured funding for voice over IP, uh, basically jingle, audio, and video calls, and that's going to be the next thing I'll be working on. Um, yeah, there's Quixi. Um, that's basically a, a spin-off of conversations, not a fork, but uh, something that's developed in the same source tree. And that's basically conversations, but you can onboard with your phone number and it would automatically find other Quixi users based on their phone number. Um, and you can also chat with regular XMPP users on that. And Quixi users can also manually add uh, other XMPP addresses. Or, like as a normal XMPP user, you can add a Quixi user by knowing their phone number and typing phone number at quixi.im and talking to that as if it were a regular XMPP. Uh, account, which, which it is. Which it is. Um, 
So, or to make it even easier for um, Quixi users, you could also add your phone number and XMPP address to the so-called Quixi directory, and that will enable Quixi users to discover your real XMPP address um, based on your phone number. And so basically, like the tagline is that, that conversations is for you and Quixi is for your non-nerd friends. And yeah, I've, I've heard stories well, where people sent the Quixi, placed a link to their grandmother, and like two minutes later they got contacted on XMPP because like discovery and sign up is so easy. Um, so yeah, if you are thinking about giving Quixi to your non-nerd friends, uh, you probably want to enter your phone number and your XMPP address into the Quixi directory, and with that code you can also do that for free. Usually it's uh, five bucks per entry, and that's used to like cross-finance uh, Quixi, because like, Quixi is available for free, uh, also to, to make the onboarding easier, and yeah, so that's how we usually try to fund the server, but yeah. If you want to do it now, you can do it for free with that code. Um, yeah, another interesting set of clients um, are the clients that were formerly known as Tigers Messenger. Um, and that could have actually been interesting because um, it's a branding thing. So, so if they would have kept the name across all platforms, you could just theoretically tell people, just download Tigers Messenger. And then, no matter what platform they are currently on, uh, it would just work out, right? Um, however, um, apparently, it was like completely separate apps, and then um, their customers was were very confused that even though it's all the Tigers messengers, that like like different feature sets, and yeah, apparently for the company that does that, uh, there's also a um, little incentive to make them. Uh, to gain feature parity between them, because usually it's a, a server manufacturer, and um, to them, Tigers and the other clients is it's just a tech demo to to show their customers what XMPP is capable of, and so they split it off and gave like um, each client for each platform a different name. Um, so the clients for um, iOS and macOS, Siskin and Beagle are probably the most interesting. Um, because they are kind of feature complete, they support HTTP upload and a memo and even jingle calls. And on the, those platforms, the competition isn't really good either. So they are definitely interesting to check out. Um, yeah, Xara, that's a similar situation like that. That is also one client that on, on papers available on different platforms. Uh, it, it used to be an Android client for a long time, but they also have a web client. And they are also working on an iOS client, which is currently in a closed beta and there's no public source code yet. Um, so yeah, that's another contender in the unified brand approach. Um, but uh, to be honest, it's a little bit worrisome because apparently they don't like a lot of the standard extensions. Um, like they, they don't like Mux, they don't like stream management, and uh, they always write on the uh, XMP standards mailing list how they don't like the extensions, and they have come up with something that is way, way better, but it's only documented in Russian. And yeah, so I'm not sure what their future plans are. So they might actually develop that into something that's not actually compatible with XMPP anymore, but we'll see. You, it's definitely worth like keeping an eye on. Um, so yeah, lessons learned. That's not actually um, probably not actually lessons, and in, in that I don't have a conclusion on that, but more like observations I made. Um, for example, uh, there's the thing of Jingle file transfer uh, versus HTTP upload. So Jingle is a fairly complex protocol. Uh, to negotiate peer-to-peer -peer sessions. Uh, it can be used to negotiate voice of IP sessions, but also file transfer. Um, basically everything that can be sent peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. It's very powerful, but it's also very complex. Um, in a way, it's a protocol within a protocol, and people love it be because in theory you can use it to send fi large files between people, and the server's not involved at all. 
However, due to its complexity, it only has three Finnish implementations. And every time I did interop testing with one of the other implementations, I discovered bugs in either conversations or the other side. And yeah, on the other hand, you have something like HTTP upload, um, where files are not exchanged directly, but are stored temporarily on the XMPP server. And it gets the jo job done, and anyone can implement it in the afternoon. Um, yeah, on the other hand, you have something like Omimo, which is also like a fairly complicated extension as well. But nowadays, it's actually widely implemented. Um, some clients, like the, uh, um, the Windows Universal platform thing I, I told you about, uh, even gave it a higher priority to implement than uh, some other more essential extensions. Um, however, there isn't really a good alternative available to, to um, to a MIMO, end users really want to use end-to-end -end encryption. So, yeah, even if that's not a really perfect extension, it's, it's, it will still get implemented. Okay, that already concludes my talk. Are there any questions? <laughs> Test, is this on? Test, test. Hello, hello. Uh, can you rep repeat your question? I guess. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, um, does uh, uh, the Quixie financing, your business model, does it actually work I, or are you paying for Quixie? Uh, <laughs> Good question. No, it doesn't really. Um, I mean, I came up with that elaborate uh, business model because sending SMS is really expensive. And I was like dreaming of a thousand registration a day or a month or whatever, right? And then I would run into very high costs to send those SMS. Right, so I was desperately looking for a business model because I couldn't pay for a thousand SMS a month myself, right? But in reality, I only get like a hundred SMS a month or whatever, and I can easily pay for that myself and kind of cross finance that with um, with what I get from from the conversations revenue on, on the Google Play Store or um, the few entries we do see on the on the directory. But no, currently the, the entries in the directory are not paying for the server. But, but that's still fine because I'm, I mean, I'm making money off of conversations on the Play Store and I can just cross finance it that, that way. And uh, a second question is, uh, what if other, other developers would create uh, a sing similar onboarding experience like Quixi and uh, would, they, would you uh, ask them to... Uh, provide an own directory or would you like to federate or I mean it may be confusing if uh, every app has its own directory yeah good question as well um, so I mean it depends a little bit on what they want if they wanted to do that the, the um, source code for the Quixie directory is open source and they could just combine that with an eJabbardy and just do their own thing and but I could also imagine that, like for example, if the chat secure developer wanted to do Quixi for iOS and just use the same address space, that they could would just um, use my directory and my server. Might be open for that. I mean, it's a little bit challenging. I wouldn't really want anyone to use it without telling me, even though they could. I mean, the the API is even documented and everything. Um, but I'm a little bit afraid of, of running into the problems that I briefly mentioned with Tiger, that you have two different apps, essentially, that are called the same, that are both called Quixie, but they are behaving very differently. If they're not having feature priority, or then someone joins the chat room and I have a problem with Quixie, I can't send files. Then you first have to ask back what platform are you using because they are behaving that differently. So, But yeah, if, I mean, if someone would write a really good um, iOS clients that would be like on par with conversations. I would be totally open for them to just use the same domain. Okay, I guess no more questions. Then thank you again. <laughs>